Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's live broadcast, Standards for Mixed Pathogen Detection via Metagenomics, presented by Jason Kral. He is the leader of the Metagenomic Pathogen Detection Program at National Institute of Standards and Technology. I am Marjorie Torres of Labrits, and I will be your moderator for today's event. We are delighted to bring you this educational web seminar presented by Labrits. Labrits is the leading scientific social networking website and producer of educational virtual events and webinars. Before we begin, I would like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time you want during the presentation. Just click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen and type your questions into the drop-down box that appears on the screen. We'll answer as many of your questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. If you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, please click on the Help Desk button located in the promotional board at the bottom or center of your screen, or use the Ask a Question box to let us know that you're having a problem. This presentation is educational and thus offers continuing education credit. Please click on the Continuing Education Credits tab located in the top right corner of the presentation window and follow the process to obtain your credit. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Jason Kral. I will now turn the presentation over to him. Thank you. And uh, I'd like to thank all of uh, you for tuning in. And my co-authors on this work are Dr. Sam Forey, Eric Aramzos, Nate Olson, and Scott Jackson. And I'm going to be presenting our work today on standards for mixed pathogen detection via metagenomics. Also need to acknowledge uh, several people, including Heike Zichtig from the FDA uh, and Steve Choquette from NIST, especially for uh, financially supporting uh, a lot of this work, including our other collaborators at NIST, uh, Los Alamos, MRI Global, and Cosmos ID. NIST is a non-regulatory federal agency uh, laboratory within the Department of Commerce, and we've been around for over 100 years, have a staff of about 5,000 people and two primary locations in Maryland and Colorado. <clears throat> Our mission is to boost the U.S. innovation and industrial competitiveness by advancing measurements, uh, standards, and technology which benefit the economy and our quality of life. So jumping straight to the problem, uh, detecting and identifying pathogens, both known and novel, remains a major challenge. Uh, community awareness of the problem has really improved significantly over the last five, 10, even 20 years, as some of the traditional characterization techniques, uh, which are still effective, have shown significant limitations. And the threat of widespread antimicrobial resistance, which has been popularized in both scientific and even the general community, um, yet a lot of these problems still persist, uh, despite some considerable effort and rapid advances in sample preparation, sequencing, and computational tools. And I would argue, and I think everybody would agree, that these advances are great. Uh, we need this to help tackle what, what, what is and will continue to be a significant challenge to uh, our healthcare system. However, it may be that a plethora of choices that we have uh, that are available to researchers have created uh, something of an unintended problem. Um, do we have too many choices? Uh, the, there are myriad simple sample preparation methods, sequencers, uh, computational algorithms to help us analyze our uh, samples and our data, but selecting one combination that's appropriate, good, much less best, can be a real challenge. So long story short, uh, we're lacking a lot of materials and methods to help validate, compare, and consensify these two new tools globally. Uh, I would start by saying each of these components that's being developed uh, undergoes rigorous characterization. Everybody that I know and have talked to who, who develops these types of tools clearly understands how to benchmark their technologies. That's not really the problem. Uh, it's in fact the individuals and the organizations who've come to us to ask for help with this matter, recognizing the limitations within their current situation and identifying the needs uh, for unbiased and rigorous materials characterization and methods. Um, which will not only enable their work uh, and, and the community, but also uh, help improve the access acceptability of these, uh, of translating their their work into um, uh, answering the question of how do we how do we detect pathogens? Uh, as a community, we're always seeking to accept uh, to 
find acceptable benchmarks and gold standard type materials, which help enable this type of validation. Here on the slide, I have sort of three examples of, of standards, which some of you may know, some of you may not know. These are sort of the physical materials, but uh, even more, there are also uh, analyses and, and standard outputs that people use routinely in a, in a variety of works. This happens to be a flow meter. Um, where people use this to sort of standardize uh, the output so that people understand what they're what they're getting when they either buy something or, or when a tool has been calibrated. So NIST fulfills its mission in part through developing standards and reference materials. And as a non-regulatory agency, these standards are adopted by consensus. So nothing is, is being forced on anybody. Uh, and in this particular instance, we are working with both our industrial and regulatory partners to develop uh, the type of reference material that will help facilitate uh, the evaluation and adoption of these metagenomic tools. Back in 2015, uh, we convened a workshop of industrial, academic, and regulatory stakeholders to address a lot of these issues. Uh, this report is available online. We had a follow-up workshop in 2017. That, a bit, that workshop uh, report will be available very soon. Um, and in that 2015 workshop, we decided that we would focus on clinical applications um, and the particular aspects of uh, which strains we would be looking at, um, at at first to sort of focus on bacterial DNA because we knew uh, these could be grown clonally uh, and, and the sources of the, the DNA itself would be relatively stable and, and this would be effective. And ultimately, the, the choice of which strains to choose or, or was uh, around the challenge of, of, of the workflows themselves. So when you're looking at this, you're interested in characterizing what near neighbors might be present. Uh, what effect does the, the GC content have on the analysis? If you have repeat regions, if you have uh, resistance markers and things like this. Additionally, it was uh, emphasized that the materials should be left unmixed for modularity so that eventually people could make, uh, could mix and match uh, to make their own mixtures to uh, address the specific concerns of their applications. Um, and finally, ultimately, all of this has got to be used to help uh, evaluate the performance metrics of their systems. So things like the sensitivity, specificity, accuracy, precision, et cetera. And um, on top of all of that, uh, perhaps most importantly, is not only the material, but also the data and the methods used to characterize these materials. Uh, we'll, and this will all be made available publicly. And this will include concentration, uh, size, sequencing data, uh, and the methods used and all the associated metadata to go along with that. So the purpose of the this material is for developing uh, um, uh, to improve our understanding of the performance metrics, so the sensitivity, specificity. I'm sure everybody who's tuning in uh, has certainly seen characterizations like this. The, this really serves uh, two purposes. One, it helps the people who are developing the processes understand uh, how well they perform uh, and, and any potential blind spots that they have. But it also enables the regulatory agencies who oversee uh, the claims made by these tool developers to make sure that they um, are generally useful uh, and, and can be adopted and used um, by everybody. But for all this to happen, uh, you need to have a reproducible reference material. It needs to be stable. You need to know what the concentration is, and you need to be able to check and make sure all of that is true. So uh, digging in a little bit deeper into the to the meat of the problem, um, for those of you who've never seen the sample workflow of, of an NGS-based system, here it is. Uh, your sample is uh, collected. You then extract the DNA. That DNA is then prepared to be put on a sequencer. The sequencer then reads out and generates a, a relatively large data file, which includes things like uh, bases and quality scores. Uh, and, <clears throat> and ultimately then that data file is then gonna be fed into some sort of an informatic tool. And that can include some sort of taxonomic classification, uh, looking for virulence markers, maybe genome assembly uh, and the like. Um, um, and every step along this way, uh, whatever it is, biases are being introduced. Uh, and these biases propagate throughout the entire pipeline. And one way to understand and potentially correct these biases is through use of standards uh, interspersed into this process. Uh, I'm 
showing here, there are a number of institutions and, and, and folks who have devoted considerable effort uh, to this. And due to the asymmetric nature of the workflow, it's often really difficult to test biases mid-analysis. So uh, you, you tend to have to work backwards in your characterization, starting from things like uh, well-characterized data sets from, say, maybe purified known isolates, uh, eventually working up to purified DNA, and then hopefully eventually something like whole cells with fixed genomes and node abundances. And this is all important because uh, you won't be able to really characterize your workflow uh, until you characterize the biases sort of at each step along this process. So this is uh, just an example of sort of what our, how we envisioned our material will be incorporated into this workflow. Um, what you see on the top left is what would be a, essentially a pool of well-characterized pathogen DNAs, which we would then mix into whatever ratios we wanted. This example would be a, a log 10 dilution. The sample would be just like any other metagenomic uh, characterization. The, the, the sample would be processed, put through a sequencer. The metagenomic analysis would then be run on it. And then ultimately you might wanna characterize how well did your system perform relative to uh, what you know you put into the system to begin with? And so in this sense, you could uh, very much close the loop on what you've got. We, uh, the initial characterization of the DNA itself, we are looking at the concentration and purity, obviously. Uh, so doing a, a, an orthogonal method of both absorbance and fluorescence measures, uh, looking at the size distributions, doing assembly, uh, or sorry, doing sequencing which allows us to characterize the uh, not only assembly of the genome, but also any potential contamination, and also uh, start to evaluate the stability of the material, knowing that it has to last on the order of about five years, hopefully more, uh, in, a, in a refrigerator. And now, some of you are probably going to be asking, why are we going to all this trouble? This is pure DNA. It should be good enough for any number of applications. And, and to that, I, I would say, if you really want to know how well your assay and your analysis can perform, you first have to understand the limitations of the materials and the methods that you're using and, and know how to benchmark that. So for detection, there's really three things you're going to have to answer, especially in a system like this. Uh, first is, are the organisms that you're looking for, even in the database and, and the type of tool that you're using, uh, are they even present? And it seems like a silly question, but it's often overlooked and given the large number of genomes that are available in many of today's taxonomic classification databases, it's very likely that near neighbor genomes are present. Um, and that's great, but that may or may not suit your particular application. Second is how deep is your sequencing? Uh, it may be obvious that there's limitations here, but uh, often you have to consider what level of confidence you need, whether it's uh, a presence absence type of an assay or if you're attempting to quantify abundance. Uh, and last is how similar is the DNA that you're looking for to the rest of the DNA that's present. Um, spend a little bit of time on this over the next couple slides, but uh, this is a difficult and sometimes unknown part of the detection challenge. Uh, in some clinical cases, it may be relatively straightforward if you're looking for what amounts to a monoclonal pathogen within a human DNA background. Uh, however, a lot of polymicrobial infections, <clears throat> excuse me, with antimicrobial resistance strains uh, are a serious concern. And uh, it really confounds a lot of the traditional culture and even some of the new uh, molecular based techniques. And Dr. Rita Caldwell brought this up at our last workshop. Uh, and I think what she was trying to do is highlight not only the challenge of it, but really the, the potential power of this technology and where it can really stand up and start to shine. So the, this first example comes out of Dr. Charles Chu's lab at UCSF, where they took uh, a human sample, which had Ebola in it, uh, and ran it through a nanopore sequencer using a, a custom classification software. And what you see here is the cumulative number of reads as a function of runtime. And what they showed is that over the course of about eight to 15 minutes, they were able to positively detect Ebola virus within their sample. Um, and this is really remarkable because you could do this from a single read. Uh, the reason you could do that is because the, um, 
the signal, the RNA, or in this case, really, I think it's the cDNA, uh, is so distinct and the read is sufficiently long that there is no ambiguity in the measurement. Uh, it's also likely a real read. It's not some sort of an uh, informatic artifact. It's unlikely that the number of base errors that would accumulate would start to resemble Ebola virus from human DNA. And so you can sort of start to see the potential power of this type of an approach for the right applications right now. I mean, this work is, is already three years old um, because there are a lot of similar applications that exist and uh, the bar to address the relative performance metrics, sensitivity and specificity uh, is set in a place where I think most people uh, with the right application could really handle it. Looking at the other extreme of this, you might have two very similar organisms which you're trying to differentiate. It might be something taking maybe at the, the, the most extreme of a, of a single SNP identifying two different strains. This can be enormously challenging as trying to identify those differences uh, if they exist at low levels or even at moderate levels, but with poor sequencing depth can make it uh, extremely difficult to accurately uh, identify and, and characterize, especially considering that there is some error involved in the sequencing. Um, and so on the, 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 the graph that I'm showing here, sort of your limited detection is a function of taxonomic difference. Maybe a better way to plot it would be to actually look at genomic differences and depending on the type of organism that you're looking at, uh, the more closely related the organisms are, the harder it is to distinguish them, right? And so that, that sort of intuitively makes sense. Um, um, but it can, be, it, it can be really difficult. Anybody who's sort of worked with taxonomic classification tools or, or, or tools like this can tell you that at the genus and the species level, most of the tools do uh, at least an adequate and often a, a, an excellent job of discriminating. Um, but quantification can still be a real challenge. Uh, and the reason for, I think, all of this lies in the biases and errors that propagate through your analysis. So this includes not only your sequencing errors, but also your database errors, omissions, misidentifications, any potential contamination that might have happened in your sample, or the materials that you're using to actually benchmark your analysis itself. So the candidate reference material that we're trying to produce for NGS-based pathogen detection excuse me, is a DNA in solution. These are not whole cell materials. This is, this is DNA in one XTE buffer. Uh, we're including, uh, looking to include 24 components. These are bacterial DNA and one human uh, DNA. We're gonna give you the copy number, genome copy number per microliter and include as part of the data, the assembled genomes, uh, qubit nanodrop concentrations and drop the digital PCR assay results as well as the assays themselves so that you can do it and check it. Uh, and the idea being that this type of a material you could then use to build mixtures that'll suit your application. If you look closely at the list, you'll see a number of near neighbors. Uh, it incorporates high, low GC content, a number of um, uh, uh, sort of disease origins. All that to say, um, this type of a material can be used uh, to suit your needs. Getting to the characterization itself, we've elected to take a four-step process. Uh, I've already touched on uh, several of these. Uh, the DNA concentration and size uh, is sort of the initial QC. So we'll do a qubit and a nanodrop measurement on it and do an agarose gel. And this is just to make sure that the stuff is coming in as spec. It's supposed to be 100 nanograms per microliter and the size fragments should be above 10 KB. Um, so really nothing too surprising there. Next, the samples get put through sequencing where we typically do a Nextera XT prep and a MySeq 2x300 um, using an automated sample prep. We've also had the samples analyzed on, uh, on PAC Biosystems, thanks to uh, FDA for helping with that. <clears throat> and at that point, all of that data uh, then gets fed into a couple different, uh, couple different routes. One, we'll do taxonomic classification uh, of the reads that come out. So this will include things like um, uh, systems like Kraken, uh, Metaflan, Gotcha, Centrifuge. Um, later on, I'll show some of the results that we have from some of the centrifuge analyses. Um, we also do assembly. So this might be from uh, spades or canoe or something like that. And we'll also do mapping to reference genomes. And really all this is just to make sure that um, any sort of gross level problems of the material itself that we catch early on. And ultimately go on to do PCR. So it includes uh, 
qPCR assay for positive ID and contamination check, but also to do the droplet digital PCR characterization to look at absolute abundance. This is an example of a, a good component. So this is Aramonas uh, hydrophila, uh, one of the ATCC strains that we have. And what you see here on the left is a centrifuge output uh, of the taxonomic classification tool. And I'm sort of showing two columns here, the unique reads and the, and the relative abundance, um, just the way this, this particular classifier outputs and uh, sort of net net and all of this. What you see is that the genus and the species level is really no contamination. Uh, you do, in fact, see a, uh, a phage, an aromatous phage that sort of is in there, which helps support the idea that this is actually pure material. We don't see a lot of the other phages. You do see a few uh, near neighbors popping up in this. This is likely due to sequencing errors. It's also highly likely that this particular strain of Veromonas is not in the database. So we, we see a strong uh, association to the species level, but at the, uh, uh, the strain level, this may or may not be correct, and that's, that's fine. Um, as at this phase, it's sort of just a, a, a quick pass through. But uh, from, from this type of data and the PAC bio data that we've done, we've been able to generate uh, improved high quality draft assemblies uh, of the genomes using these multiple sequencing platforms. Uh, and on top of that, we're able to do a size characterization of the genome. For those of you who've assembled genomes before, you know that uh, from all the, the, the sum of all the contexts, that'll give you an idea of what the, uh, uh, the genome size is. And at this point, for, for a strain like this, it, it matches very closely to several reference genomes that we have of the material. Um, we also have materials that we have to reject from time to time. As you see, uh, in this case, from the, the same type of centrifuge output, I highlight the, the two organisms that appear to be present in this, and this is Acrombacter xylus oxidans and Acinetobacter baumannii. Uh, so this material passed the initial QC. It had the right concentration, the right fragment size, but once we put it through the sequencer, we see strong evidence that there are, in fact, two components in here. And on further check, we found that uh, some of the tubes were very likely mislabeled um, before they were blended. And so this material simply gets rejected and it's, it's being remanufactured. Um, but in the, in the idea of sort of making lemonade out of lemons sometimes, um, we're able to do uh, a partial genome assembly of this, which gives a number of very large uh, contigs, which we can then not only use to sort of confirm that, yes, these are in fact the two organisms that are present, but we can also generate uh, PCR assays, which we can use for later testing of the materials that, um, that we're going to come back and accept. Uh, in addition, we can map to reference genomes. Um, uh, here I'm showing the data that we got for our Typhimurium L uh, Salmonella enterica, Typhimurium LT2 strain, uh, and mapped this to a known LT2 strain you see here. Coverage here ranges from somewhere in the 120 to 220 range. I don't really see any dropouts or any any, any misses or insertions or anything like that. So uh, this shows we're getting uh, appropriate similarity to, to known good genomes. And so this this type of material is good. This is yet, yet another check to make sure that we're doing a good job and the material is what we think it is. Moving to droplet digital PCR or DDPCR as, as you'll see um, here. Uh, this is one ongoing effort to help develop and perform uh, panels of assays to help assess the genome copy number for the concentration of these genomes. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with droplet digital PCR, and it's probably a lot of people, uh, in many ways it's actually very similar to traditional PCR or qPCR. You're using the same types of primers, uh, probes, and reaction conditions. The difference comes in the readout. So in droplet digital, you're producing an array of, uh, depending on the tool, uh, thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of these discrete droplets uh, where you're going to have a limiting dilution of your particular target and then ultimately send it through an, a high throughput reader and count the number of positive uh, droplets in this. Compare that to traditional qPCR, which is more of a bulk threshold type technique. Uh, the nice thing about droplet digital is that we can get to about 8% uncertainty on the actual genome copy numbers in this. Uh, we, we can't really do that with qPCR, so this has become more of our, our um, preferred methodology. With the, uh, so how would you use that? The genome copy number concentration can be converted back to, uh, to mass concentration of nanograms per microliter. 
just simply using the genome uh, molecular weight. And one of the reasons why we produce that genome is not only for the informatics part, but also so that we can uh, use it to, to intercompare with, uh, with other uh, concentration-based methods such as qubit and nanodrop. So just to give you an example of, of how well this works, um, this is our Pseudomonas aeruginosa droplet digital PCR assay run against here uh, nine of our components, uh, and they range in similarity, everything from uh, some, some of the same gamma proteobacters uh, all the way to things that are really not very similar at all. And the only thing that comes up is Pseudomonas aeruginosa. So it seems to be very, uh, not only sensitive, but also very selective to uh, the strain of interest and we don't get a lot of false positives. So this, this type of assay works very well. And essentially what you're looking at here is the intensity versus the, uh, the, the droplet number. So in this particular case, there were, uh, looks like a couple hundred thousand droplets that were processed over um, probably about an hour, a couple hours. And the only samples that, the only sample uh, set that really came back positive was the Pseudomonas aeruginosa. So with this candidate reference material, we're trying to make it as open source as possible. So this is to enable the flexibility of our reference material to address a host of metagenomic characterizations uh, and challenges. So we certainly envision stakeholders developing Latin square type uh, experimental models where you can test things like linear detection and also some of the sensitivity and specificity uh, performance metrics that, that uh, most applications are going to be required to, to pass. We've undertaken some preliminary work to, to try and start demonstrating this, and, and we'll get into that. Uh, clearly, there are other factors that one may need to characterize. Um, characterizing the differences between near neighbors at varying levels of, uh, of coverage uh, certainly would pop up. Also, things like high and low GC content, uh, making mixtures uh, to, to, to try and elucidate uh, what kind of an impact these different factors would have. And, and obviously you may want to um, focus more, more strongly or, or less strongly depending on your particular application, how important those factors are. Um, but whatever the experiment, ultimately what you're aiming to do is to improve the metagenomic characterization of the sample uh, of your mixed microbes. So this material should be a tool to not only help you elucidate these blind spots, uh, in your analysis pipeline, but also the quality, uh, help you quantify these effects and, and point forward to strategies which will help you either mitigate or even possibly eliminate these biases. So, as I mentioned, two main questions that typically come up, limit of detection and discrimination between near neighbors. To do this, you're gonna need efficient experimental designs um, to answer those questions. Uh, and very importantly, it should be readily integratable within uh, NGS workflows. Uh, and hopefully you can also do some in, uh, parallel in silico analyses of these. Um, uh, there, there are a number of different experimental design protocols you can use. Um, being able to do this efficiently, uh, we think is really important because sequencing is, is moderately slow and still moderately expensive. Um, and so we, we think it's important to address to get as much information out of the design as possible. Uh, that's why we've been looking at the Latin square type design. And many of you have certainly run sample analyses like these, uh, have some number of components that you sort of roll through uh, the concentrations. You may even be able to pool and subsample to reduce the number of mixtures. And something like this, uh, using a limited number of mixtures would enable you to do this with a relatively small throughput or a sorry, small footprint on a uh, multiplex NGS type of approach. Um, so moving to one of the uh, the metagenomic uh, mixtures that we produced, this was an equigeno, actually it was an equimass mixture that we generated uh, containing two strains of salmonella, uh, Staph aureus and Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Uh, so on the, on the graph, what you see here on the left is what we input into the system and then the results from the taxonomic classification using the same data set uh, from the four different tools are, are shown after that. And what you see, uh, what we think we see is that there's certainly biasing that bias that's happening in this, in this analysis. And that's probably likely due to some sample prep, but there are also some misclassifications in this. 
Uh, most of the tools did a pretty good job of identifying the different uh, species and strains that are present. Uh, gotcha seemed to have a little problem identifying uh, uh, the Pseudomonas, but you know, it, it is what it is. Uh, and there's certainly a need to, to do some secondary in silico data comparison. Um, but you see overall, the tools seem to work pretty well. The, the abundances differ fairly significantly, but uh, I think it underscores the point that the, uh, we know that the biases exist and now we're able to sort of look at and track objectively uh, these differences in biases. Looking at identifying near neighbors uh, in these mixtures, this was, a, this was a significant challenge for most of these tools. And it was clear each tool had uh, some real problems with this. Um, looking only here at presence absence, I'm not even trying to look at abundance. This is gonna simplify things. Also, uh, in this instance, we're looking to exclude uh, metaflane from the analysis simply because it's not really set up to look at subspecies level identification. Uh, and the different tools are also reporting subspecies ID differently. Um, there's not really a standard way of doing this, which is okay, but it certainly makes the comparisons and my job here a little bit more difficult. Um, and we're not trying to attempt to say that one tool is better or worse. Instead, what we're trying to get at here is to evaluate the tool's performance so that uh, if, if one is looking to use a tool that you're able to make an informed decision about um, what this, what each tool is, is specifically good at and where you may have challenges if you're trying to use it in perhaps the wrong application. And so what we observed um, from this relatively simple mixture was, um, I think if you've heard me say this, is, is it's not so simple. Um, tools like the BWA algorithm and Kraken, and, and this is largely all run on the uh, on LANL's BioEdge platform. Um, in some cases, they report a large number of potential strains. This could be great if you're trying to identify a novel pathogen or, or, or novel uh, novel organisms of some type. Um, and It could give you strong evidence that maybe a strain is there or isn't there if you know that it's in your database. Um, other tools, such as Gotcha and actually also Metaflan, uh, appear to have some level of trying to reduce the output complexity to simplify the output uh, and be much more selective in terms of what it reports. And again, uh, not really trying to say uh, anyone is right or wrong here. Uh, the systems are biased in their ways. They're, they're choosing to, um, to filter and or exclude or include certain things just depending on, on, on how it's written. It's just a computer program, right? Uh, but it certainly opens the door for more application-directed studies uh, where you can begin to look at the effects of sequencing requirements, um, what additional database features you may want to include if you need to look for virulence or disease markers, and perhaps also thinking towards our, what, what is the application type? Are you trying to develop something for more clinical utility or are you trying to identify novel pathogens and then trying to select the right tools uh, for that job? So all in all, uh, we think that there, there's significant work that needs to happen in evaluating um, sort of subspecies level identification and we're hoping, we think the, the new reference materials should be able to help out with this. Looking at dilutions um, in advance, I apologize for the horrible colors. Um, I'm gonna briefly touch on this because I think you're gonna hear a lot of the same themes that we've talked about with the equal mass mixture. Uh, we've set a somewhat arbitrary cutoff here of 0.05%. Um, this was just at looking at the data. Uh, we started to see a lot more uh, what appeared to be false positives uh, starting to exceed the number of true positives from what we put into the individual sample. Uh, and most of the tools actually did a fairly good job of, uh, of identifying presence, the major components, and those being the, the Klebsiella and the, the Salmonella strains, as you see in this. And even the abundances are really not that far off. Um, they're all fairly close, and this is not really unexpected. Most of these tools are actually, one, really well designed to handle samples like this, and two, the, the differences in these individual species and strains are fairly large, and so the samples uh, should be readily distinguished by, by the tools themselves. Um, but as you see, there, there, are, there, there is some performance difference in these, and the false positive rates uh, certainly vary depending on the type of tool you're using. The point is, <clears throat> again, you can start to evaluate uh, how each of these analyses performs uh, using fairly objective criteria because you know the inputs of your sample. Uh, looking ahead, 
we're going to keep pushing on sequencing and droplet digital to uh, finalize characterization of our candidate reference material. Uh, this will include not only abundance, but also the draft genomes, PCR assays, sequencing data, all of that's going to be made open source, all available to everybody who, who uses the material. Uh, and we're going to be looking at ways that we can effectively probe uh, experimental space using uh, mixtures uh, to, to look at workflow characterization. There's going to be a considerable push, I think, in the in silico space, looking at computational tools to, to validate and, and support the experimental work, the, the wet bench work specifically. Um, this will include not only simulated, but also subsampling of the reads, uh, looking at statistically significant number of experiments that are going to be necessary to, to identify uh, differences and, and performance levels. Uh, also looking at potential inner lab studies to develop uh, and expand and evaluate the, the mixtures that we're developing. And also to engage all of you uh, to understand what your needs are. Are there strains that we're missing in this that'll help uh, help us and help you evaluate your tools better? Um, are there other organisms that we're missing, viruses and fungi? And I'll talk about the viruses in a minute, but um, we're always looking to engage our, our, our stakeholders. And so uh, in another year or so, we'll be talking again about the next workshop. And so we hope uh, all of you will, will tune in for that and, and come help us. Uh, getting to sort of some potential future work. Um, this is right now in concept stage, um, so, so nothing is set in stone. Uh, just throwing out the idea there of, of we excluded viruses from the original panel of what we were looking at because it, it was frankly going to be very difficult uh, to incorporate a number of um, export controlled organisms into a, into a reference material or something like this. But after having uh, uh, talked to, to regulators and, and and people who handle these things on a regular basis uh, come up with some potential solutions. Um, one of them being to incorporate uh, viral DNA into a, a, a plasmid backbone, which you could then swap in and out different components um, using small parts of viruses. So if, if the components are too large, uh, it starts to look a little bit too much like a virus and you start running afoul of, of regulating controls. And so in this instance, what you're looking at is, is just from marker regions. So, so small portions of genomes um, that, that are not going to be problems, are not going to create viruses themselves, and, and, and but still allow you to, uh, to characterize the materials, um, hopefully, that you're going to be looking to detect. The other nice thing about this is it's probably also amenable to DNA and RNA. So not only uh, the DNA itself, which would be grown up on a, on a plasmid, but also you could incorporate um, promoters and, and generate RNA using some sort of an in vitro uh, transcription reaction uh, to look at the, all the classes of viruses here. So single-stranded, double-stranded uh, DNA and RNA and the like. Um, so again, this is just in the planning phases, uh, phases sorry, uh, but uh, you, you can sort of see we're, we're trying to, to expand out to, to these additional areas uh, as quickly as we can to help um, folks readily uh, and, and quickly evaluate these types of uh, materials. So to conclude and summarize, uh, receipt and characterization of the material is, is still ongoing. Everything looks like it's on track to uh, be complete uh, late this summer. Um, and the uh, material will be uh, not only characterized, uh, but also uh, all of that data will be made available. Uh, hopefully, we've shown here that a well-characterized reference material will help enable NGS-based metagenomics to deliver on its promise of not only doing pathogen detection, but also multiple pathogen detection, um, strain level differentiation and the like. Uh, we've worked to identify mixture models that'll help highlight uh, differences and in, in heterogeneities in, in the types of analyses. Um, and hopefully really hammered home the point here that even though we're trying to work with simple mixtures, sometimes the answers aren't so simple. Uh, many of the experimental models uh, will help us evaluate the uh, analytical performance metrics. And uh, there is no one best tool at this point that will that will do everything. Each one is suited to a different application. Each one has its strengths and weaknesses, and uh, hopefully our materials will help people uh, evaluate those effectively. And looking, uh, looking in the future uh, will include in silico and inner laboratory studies and also possibly expanding to other types of materials such as, as viral standards. Uh, and with that, if, if you want to get your hands on, on this DNA when, it, when it's ready, email us at nispathogen at nist.gov. Uh, we'll be shipping this out after it's completed. The only thing that we ask is that you're going to share the data with us. So we'll have a, a bio project that you can upload to. Um, this information will be on microbialstandards.org. 
uh, and then obviously we'll have priority uh, for people who want to uh, participate in our inner lab studies and help us out with characterization and the like. And with that, uh, I'd like to take your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jason Kroll, for that informative presentation. We will now start the live Q&A portion of the webinar. If you have a question you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the Ask a Question drop-down box located on the far left of your presentation window. Type your questions into the box that appears on your screen and click the Send button. We'll answer as many of your questions as we have time for. Let's get started. Our first question is, with regarding to microbiome and environmental samples, can this material be used to help measure the abundance of organisms? Right, so that's a, that's a really good question. Um, this material wasn't originally designed to do uh, microbiome or environmental studies per se. Um, that was certainly one of the, the factors that came into, uh, there were certainly those people were in the room when we were originally talking about this material. Um, uh, at this stage, uh, I, I don't know. Actually, that's that's a that's kind of part of what we want to see what this material is actually capable of. And so, some of the mixture models that we're looking to develop will hopefully help us to answer this type of question. Um, it's not designed as a mock community, uh, certainly, but we think um, looking at abundance and looking at uh, levels of, of detection uh, of what's there is certainly an important part of this material. And um, yeah, it's certainly something we're we're interested to to follow up on further. Thank you. Our next question is, can this be used for 16S-based analysis? Right, so 16S-based analysis. So I've been talking here mostly about shotgun uh, analysis and not and not 16S. Um, I don't think there's any reason why it couldn't be. Um, these All these strains obviously have, are, are, are 16S positive uh, strains and one could do that. It's, it's not something we focused on yet. Um, I know there's the uh, the Janssen mosaic challenge that's that's looking to do some of this and has incorporated actually uh, several of these components. And so this is something we're going to be following up on as we go further. But yeah, there's no reason why 16S based um, uh, analyses wouldn't also uh, couldn't also be done on on this day on these materials. Thank you. It looks like we have time for one more question. Our last question is: Is there a whole cell material equivalent available or in the works? Right. So uh, this has all been DNA in solution. This has not been uh, a whole cell material. And at this point, we're we're not looking to ourselves produce the whole cell material equivalent. Um, these are all ATCC strains. So if you want the strains, you can certainly go buy them uh, from ATCC and produce your own mixtures. Um, one of the real challenges that we face is that producing a homogeneous, stable cell line that will remain stable sort of forever uh, is a real challenge. And I don't know that we have a really good way to do that yet. Um, it's certainly something we're looking forward to over the next um, two, three, four years for, for how does one do this? Uh, but at this point, I, I would say the short answer is no, no, we don't. Um, yes, we're looking at it. Uh, and if, if it's something you want to tackle, I certainly encourage everybody to go. Uh, if you want the, the strains themselves, you can you can just go buy them from ATCC right now. I would like to once again thank Dr. Jason Kroll for his presentation. I would also like to thank Labroots for making today's educational webcast possible. Before we go, I want to let everyone know that today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing for July of 2018. You will receive an email from Labroots letting you know when this webcast will be available for replay. Please share that announcement with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. That's all for now. Thank you for joining us, and we hope to see you again soon. Goodbye.